Konnichiwa and welcome to the Leadership Japan series and I'm your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Story, President of Dale Carnegie Training Japan and much more importantly, you are a student of leadership, highly motivated to be the best in your business field. If you find the program useful, then please share it with your friends. They might have some leadership challenges of their own. How would you like your own access to 104 years of the accumulated wisdom of Dale Cunningham training? Get our free report, Stop Wasting Money on Training, how to get the best results from your training budget, plus our free white papers, guidebooks, reports. We've got 350 training videos now, blogs, newsletters, course information, plus much, much more at japan.dalecarnegie.com. If you have a performance or people challenge in Japan, then maybe we can help you. Contact me at greg.story, that's G-R-E-G dot story, S-T-O-R-Y, at dalecarnegie.com. Well, this is episode number 140, and we are talking about starting a business in Japan. And in fact, what we're going to hear is a recording of a presentation I gave to a group of entrepreneurs here in Tokyo who are interested in uh, starting a business from scratch in Japan. I thought this might be useful, so I've uh, taken the soundtrack off that and included it here for the recording for you today. I hope you enjoy it. All right, thank you very much. As I said before, I'm really glad to be training in Japan. I know it's a great story. And today I'm going to take you through some of the sort of big picture aspects of starting a company in Japan. A lot of the micro detail will be taken care of by the consultants, so I'm not going to duplicate what they're doing. I'm going to talk probably more conceptually about how to make sure the business you begin is a success. But just before that, I'll just talk a little bit about my own company, Dale Carnegie. The icon of our business is Dale Carnegie himself, and that book on the left there, How to Win Friends and Influence People, was published in 1928, became a global smash hit, awesome bestseller. And even today, it always finishes in the top 10 business non-fiction books in any survey. So it's one of those timeless, universal pieces of advice. Uh, I'm not, I don't get any, uh, any sales revenue from the book that goes straight to his daughters, Dale Kenny's daughters. But if you haven't read the book, and you're going to be in business, and you're going to be dealing with people, this is not a bad thing to read. It's available in many languages to give you an idea of how to be more successful with people. And they came out with an updated version, the digital version, a few years ago as well. In Japanese, it's uh, different versions there. Hitokukasu and Michiwa Hirakiru have sold more than 9 million copies, which tells you that it's extremely popular in this country as well. So it's, so it's got that universal appeal. Now, we train the Fortune 500 companies in America, and we train 90% of those companies. As you can imagine, they are very powerful, very wealthy, very demanding clients. And to be in that group that train them means that what we're doing is providing a lot of value. And in the uh, Japanese companies who are actually part of the Fortune 500 list operating here, basically we train half of them here in Japan as well, in addition to all the other companies we train. We train in 97 countries around the world, so that means what we're doing is being tested every single minute of the day somewhere in the world. So we've got our university in the States, and then we're feeding into the curriculum, we're updating the curriculum. So even though we're a 104-year-old company, and even though we've been in Japan for 53 years, we're constantly refreshing the curriculum, constantly refining what we're doing. So our Kaizen period is very, very long at 104 years, and 53 years in Japan. We teach in more than 30 languages all around the world. So I asked headquarters in New York, I said, could you give me, please, last five years, the average satisfaction rate for our training? That means all courses, all seminars, all instructors, the whole works. Put in a big bag, shake it up, tell me what's the satisfaction rate. Came back at this number, 97.7%. So sometimes for uh, Japanese buyers, they look at something that's from a foreign country, and they say, well, you know, that's not going to work in Japan. It won't be suitable for Japan. Japan is different. So these types of statistics for someone like us are very helpful to take the risk factor out for Japanese buyers. And that's why I use that number to say, well, you know, we've been going 53 years. You look at the last five years. 
that's the satisfaction rate. So the person who's buying the service on behalf of their company can take some relief that they're not making a risky decision, basically. Now this actually is my originally my entire presentation. I was just going to use this one chart. But the organizers said to me, no, 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 you have to have more than one slide. So I said, okay, I'll make a few more. But everything we need to do in business is on this one slide, and it's in your pack there. It might be a little bit easier to read on the sheet in front of you than this screen, because it's a little bit light the way they've done it. But this is actually all you need to think about in running a company. And it goes through everything. It starts with the value proposition. Why should someone buy your product or service? What is it about it that's appealing? And then, you know, uh, how are you going to form the relationship with the customer? How are you going to create that relationship? Who is that customer? What is going to be the source of revenue for the company? How will that arrive? What are the channels through which you're going to distribute your product or service? Let me go across here. What are the resources you're going to need? What are the main costs you're going to incur? We go back up here. Who are going to be some likely key partners you're going to work with? They could be uh, distribution partners. They could be suppliers for you. Uh, and then finally, what are the key things you should be doing to make this business work? So it's a very simple diagram at one level, but it's a very comprehensive diagram at another. And this comes from a thing called the business canvas model. If you Google that or search for that, you'll find a lot of information on the business canvas. It's a, it's a very, in one sense, it's very simple, but it's a tremendously comprehensive look at a business. So often we have a passion about a part of the business, it might be the sales part. I really love sales and I'm a great salesperson. But we might have some elements around controlling costs, or we might have some thoughts about you know, partners, or we may not have thought about partners. We may not have thought about our value proposition. This forces us, at one glance, to see the whole company that we're going to have to create and make sure that each element is working in its entirety. And we're going to jump in now and start getting into the component pieces of that diagram. I'm going to really put up a lot of questions for you which you can ask yourself when you're starting your own company to make sure that you've actually got a business that is going to work because it doesn't matter if you get the registration, uh, legal sorted out for the company, and you do all that nitty gritty. If the fundamental way you approach the business is not going to be successful, then you'll be facing losses and you'll be out of business very quickly. So this, as I say, is a is a very good visual to think. Okay, there are many aspects to a business that are all on this one page. Right. So you won't be able to read this uh, easily here, but on your sheets of paper you can read it. It just takes those different areas and then it drills down and it asks specific questions about each of those key areas. This is a type of prompt, I'll go in more detail in a moment on the screen, but this is a type of prompt which is good for you to look at a potential business and say, well, what about this, what about that? So this is part of the resources I'll leave with you. This is a bit more simple version of that, for example, the value proposition, it says here, start in the middle, what do you do? What is the value you provide? Then how do you interact with your key customers? Uh, who do you help? Who are your customers? How will you reach them? That's your distribution channel. How much will you make? What's the revenue stream going to look like? What will it cost? There's a cost structure. What do you need? What type of resources do you need? And who will help you and how will you do it? So those very simplistic questions are very thorough at one level. And these are the things we need to plan in detail before we really get into starting the business. No point spending money and time and registering the business if you haven't really been through this process first in detail, work up your business plan, and then consider all of the aspects of the business that you'll need to uh, account for. So we start with the value proposition. And this is the key point, I think. What is your customer problem? Or what is your client problem? Are you clear about that? Have you surveyed that? Have you investigated that? Is there clarity around that? If you have clarity around that, it's going to be very hard to make your business successful. And what do they need? Now, customers' wants and customers' needs can be different. I think uh, probably everybody in this room has probably got a, uh, a mobile phone. We didn't want one of these. We didn't all put our hand up and say, well, I need a phone that can play music, 
can interconnect uh, with my uh, connect interconnect with my uh, email providers. Uh, they can go online and get me on the internet. Uh, they can tell me the weather. They can tell me a whole bunch. We didn't we didn't say I want that, but we found actually after we got it that we needed it. And now for most of us, we live with the thing 24 hours a day. So this is a good example of need and want. So there may actually be a case where your customer may need something, but they haven't discovered yet that they want it. And that's probably not a bad position to be in, because there are probably very few competitors for you. And then, what's the value? What's the value to the customer? What problem are you solving? Are you solving a quality problem? Are you solving a volume problem? Are you solving a revenue problem? Are you solving a cost problem? Which one of these problems are you going to solve for that client? And then, what is the product service range by segment? Now, it could be, in our case, we're a training company. So I've met most of you in the room, and we probably cover every industry that's going. If it's got people, then you need training. <laughs> people, business, doesn't matter what it is. If it's robots, we can't help. But if it's people, we can help. But you might be in a particular segment of an industry, or a subsector, or it may be around a product. Well, what is it that you're going to isolate out? What niche are you going to go for? In our case, we've discovered that basically, companies from the size of 30 people to 500 is a bit of a sweet spot for us. Because below that, there isn't enough volume, and above that, they tend to invest themselves and have their own internal training. So we've located, okay, here's a, doesn't mean we don't have big companies, we do. But there's a bit of a sweet spot that's easier for us to isolate out. So what's the sweet spot for you when you're thinking about your customer value proposition? And what's the minimum viable product you need to make? So sometimes if you're coming up with something new, you don't want to go into massive overheads and stocking and have lots of exposure. You might want to get out a minimum product and then see the reaction to it and test. So you're not committing all yourself and discovering you've got everything stored in your apartment and nowhere to sell it because no one wants to buy it. So these things you think about. And the solution differentiation. Now, if the customer's got a problem, you may not be the first person to think about that. There may be lots of people who are thinking about the customer problem, and they may have solutions already. So why would we need your solution? What do we need about what you're doing? So these are the sorts of things when you're looking at yourself, OK, what will make my company's solution sufficiently attractive and differentiated enough for a buyer to consume my services or uh, my product. So that's the value proposition. We start with that. Then we go to the customer. So who is your ideal customer? And I, I put the word avatar there. This is an imaginary sort of representative customer. And I suggest if you have the chance, sit down and create a little story about the customer. What age bracket are they? Gender? Where do they live? What sort of work do they do? What's their lifestyle like? What passions do they have? Have that imaginary customer in as much depth as you can possibly think of. And so when you create a solution, you have that mental image of that particular buyer in your mind. I do a lot of writing for the American Chamber Journal. I write for the British Chamber Journal. Uh, I do podcasts. I do a lot of things. I'm writing all the time on business issues. Whenever I'm writing, I have in my mind my readership, the person I'm writing for. I'm writing for that foreigner who's in Japan running a company who's trying to learn about Japan. That's my very micro niche when I write. So I've identified my avatar. And I write to that. Well, same thing. You need to identify your ideal customer. And in our business, in the training business, we have our ideal customer. We know what that looks like. So when we see it, we get very excited. And when we don't see it, we get very disappointed. <laughs> but at least we know what we're looking for. And, you know, are all customers the same? Of course they're not. Of course they're not. But what's your ideal customer and how close to that can you get? They may not be the perfect customer for you. But, you know, some customers will have different needs, different size of the company, by industry, by time of the evolution of the company, by current financial circumstances of the company, market conditions for the company will all impact on their potential for you as a customer. If you're in the financial services business at the moment, it's a nightmare. The markets have just gone berserk. It's an absolute nightmare. If you're in the asset management business, 
it's a nightmare. You've now got zero, almost zero bond rates, you know, negative. So that's, that's changing the whole dynamic of that business. And then customer segmentation. Be very, very careful as you build your client base that you segment them. Now, we made that mistake in our own company. The person who started the company didn't appreciate the importance of marketing and segmentation, so just kept on adding customers to the database. So now we've got thousands of them, tens of thousands of them, but they're not really well segmented. So now for us to go back and segment them properly is a horrendous struggle, I've got to tell you. But we've got to do it because you're trying to break out messages for different types of customers. You're sending out the same message to everybody, that's okay, but if you can take it to the next level and have a very tailored, specific message that will appeal to that particular group, that's much, much better. But it's better to do it at the beginning. So when you think about starting a company, well, what are the customer segments that I would want to appeal to? So, for example, I, I use my own company. A lot of people are IT professionals. I would like to be able to send an IT professional-oriented newsletter to that group. Others are in the finance business. I'd like the same newsletter to be rewritten slightly for that group. Some people are in retail. I'd like to have a retail version for that group. Some people are in manufacturing. I'd like to have a version for manufacturing. We didn't do that at the beginning. That was a big mistake. Now we've got to retrofit it and re-engineer it to get to that point. So my recommendation is don't be like us. Work it out from the beginning. And as you add clients, put them in those buckets. Get yourself a database that has got the segmentation. You work out the cells you need so that you can call it up. And you'll find, you know, you have Japanese, you have English. You'll have all different types of work titles. You try and pull out particular, all the buchos, all the division heads to get a particular type of correspondence, for example. Or all owners of companies get a particular type of correspondence. Well, you've got to do that at the start. You've got to say, these are the cells I need, and I'll feed the customers and clients into those cells as I populate my database. So on custom relationships, well, how do we get customers? How are you going to get customers? Where will they come from? If you're a new company, no one possibly knows you. You might have a network. But how will we know to find you? Will we find you because you're using something like AdWords, Google AdWords, Yahoo AdWords? Will we find you, maybe it's a promoter post on Facebook? Will we find you through display ads in certain niche um, marketing um, publications? How will we know that you're out there? What's your plan on finding buyers? Is it going to be getting out the phone book? Is it going to be get out the trade directory? Is it going to be get out the American Chamber of Journals directory, the British Chamber of Journal, the French, the German, the Italian, the Irish, you know, you name it. What is it going to be? Where will you find them? And then, having found them, well, what's the plan to keep them? Because undoubtedly they're going to have more than one option. So what's the strategy how we keep them? And then how do you grow them? Means you've got a customer. How do you increase the share? We call share of wallet. Okay? How much they spend with you as opposed to how much they spend with someone else. Now, as a buyer of services myself, you know, I will spend the money. I've got certain monies allocated to run my company. I will spend those monies, but it varies as to who I will spend them with. That is not necessarily locked in all the time. So if a company is providing a very good service to me, I will tend to spend more money with them and therefore not with somebody else. It's the same amount of money, it just can move around. It's very hard to actually increase the amount you're going to spend, but you can certainly allocate it differently. What we're hoping is, okay, how will we appeal to the customer, understanding the value they want, understanding what the ideal customer looks like, so that we can get more share of their wallet than our competitors. And hunting versus farming. Now, farming is ideal uh, in many ways. Subscription businesses, if you have a newspaper or a magazine subscription, that's farming. You sign up and you get that product or service right through the year. Right through the year. And so that's good. Clients there, it just turns over. That's an ideal business if you can be in it. But the other one, like us as a training business, we tend to be doing a lot of hunting. Because in our business, we'll consume the training. We train you, and then you're trained. And then we have to go and find somebody else to train. And maybe a year or two years later, we'll come back and maybe we'll do a bit more. Or maybe we won't. So ideally, I'd like to have a lot more farming in my business than I have now, because this makes life easier. That repetitious turnover is great. 
but we have to do a lot of hunting. So what about you? Are you going to be able to farm the business as an online business where you can have an established clientele? I listen to a number of podcasts. There's one particular company. Uh, this guy's got, uh, I, think it's, I think it's getting close to a 1,000 people pay him. He's an Aussie like me. You pay him about 80 bucks, 80 Aussie a month, right, to subscribe, 80 a month to subscribe to his service, give a 1,000 people. Think about those numbers. Just do the maths in your head very quickly there. That's a reasonable sum of money, isn't it? Right? That's all farming, you know? His hunting is through his podcasts and through his online activities. So what is your, what is your methodology of finding customers going to be? And will you have some existing relationships? You're buying a business. What I've bought is a franchise business, existing business, developing a franchise for Japan. It was an existing business, so certain clients came with it. Or is yours a completely new business from scratch? And you're going out there and having to find completely new customers from zero. And what's the cost of acquiring a customer? For example, I said before, Google AdWords, you know, uh, Yahoo AdWords, Facebook, display ads, trade shows. There are numbers of activities. All of these things have a cost. And so we look at the cost of the acquisition. So if I do a trade show, for example, and I get, uh, and I say I spend a million, a million yen, right, and I only get 10 customers out of that, the acquisition cost is 100,000 yen per customer. You know, that's uh, expensive, right? And so if I got a lot more, that price comes down. So sometimes you will have that acquisition cost at the beginning, and it may not be financially viable, but you've got to start somewhere. So you may be actually paying to buy customers at the beginning and then try and drive your acquisition costs down as you go forward. And what's the lifetime value of a customer? They're related. If that customer, particularly it's a, a farming situation where they're repeating every year, the initial cost then becomes amortized over a much longer period. So the lifetime value of that customer can be very high. And think about some of the things you do now where you have a uh, particular product that you like. You might be a wine, like me, you might like wine. I like wine, uh, I, I like certain cheeses, you know, I, I consume these fairly, you know, regularly. So over the lifetime that I spend buying wine, I'm a reasonably big customer, if you think of it that way, right? My, my son goes to a private school, boys school here. He's gonna be there for, you know, six years, it's not cheap. Um, so I am, from the school's point of view, not that they treat you like that, by the way, <laughs> Uh, from the school's point of view, I'm worth a lot of dough over the lifetime value that he will be at that school. Right? So then again, you think about your customer base in different ways. Right? I'll keep going. Now we move on to channels. So I said before, is this going to be online, offline, or a combination of both? We, we do training in a room like this. We also deliver training uh, online as well. We have both aspects of that. What will your business be? Will it be totally uh, virtual? Will it have a mixture of a shop or will it have an office or what will you do? How will you run the business? What do you think about there? And how will you, how will you get to those customers? How will you reach them? Will you be doing it by uh, internet? Will you be doing it by email? Will you be doing it physical goods have to be shipped to them? You know, how will you work the business? Will it be uh, like us as a training company? We're just across the road, by the way. So we've got our high performance center just across the road. We've got uh, two big training areas there. So people come there. We have trainers come there. And that's how we, we reach, that's how we deliver the, the service for the client. So that has a certain requirement, needs trainers, needs space. You see, it needs a number of things, associated costs with that to reach those uh, service delivery. And what's the cost per reach versus return? So again, it comes a bit back to that uh, acquisition cost. If you're uh, advertising in the Nikkei, right? Uh, and I've advertised in the Nikkei, full page in the Nikkei, this is expensive stuff, trust me. Even, you know, a third of a page or a quarter of a page and think, hey, this is very expensive money. Not for this company, uh, sadly, but for previous companies I've run. So, you know, there are, there are things we've got to look at in terms of how will we do it and then calculate back what is the likely cost that's going to be and then uh, what can we expect from the revenue side to justify spending that sort of money. I spend a certain amount every month on AdWords and uh, recently I started doing Facebook. Now, Facebook drives you crazy, I've got to tell you, because it's very limited in what you can do, but the costs are there. If you want to double the number of people, then you're doubling the cost for the output. So we recently had 
Uh, you might remember a very famous incident, Miss Universe. They miscued uh, the winner and the poor lady from Venezuela after having had the crown plonked in her head and everyone cheering was told, you aren't the winner. It's actually Miss Philippines. Well, Miss Philippines is a Dale Carnegie graduate. So you can imagine, we've got this gorgeous lady, Miss Universe, Dale Carnegie graduate, beautiful combination for PR. So we put that onto Facebook and we think, well, this is going to get a lot of attention. It's in the news, it's quite topical. So let's double the reach and that's double the cost. So, you know, then we have to measure, well, how many students do we get in our classes or how many companies do we make customers uh, as a result of that cost? These are the sorts of things we have to figure out. Better you have some projections before you start to work out, is this viable? Because if your cost is extremely high and your return is not going to be anywhere near that, well, don't get into business because it's going to fail. You need to work that out. Then, what are the customer needs? Okay, you're channeling your needs. Uh, is what you're offering, through whatever that medium is, going to gel with whatever the customer actually requires? And need and want, remember, need and want are different. They're not exactly the same thing. We're talking about revenue. Now, what will customers pay for it? In my case, we had an existing business we bought. So there was an established baseline of fees, trading fees. But if you're in a new business, what do you charge? Or if you're in business and you're launching a new offer, a new training program for your clients, Where's the price? For example, we're not really into a kaiwa, into English language teaching, but we do do some English for our clients who have business English needs and have, uh, you know, people know the grammar, know the vocabulary, but are too painfully shy to speak, so they don't really participate to get them involved. Now, this for us was the demand came from the client side. We didn't think about it. They came to us and said, look, can you do this for us? So we had to go and create something. That's a dilemma. What do I charge for that? What do I benchmark it against? What's something, what do I think people would put a value toward that? These are not easy decisions, I can tell you. you know, what are, they, are they paying something now with somebody else? There are a squillion, that's an official number by the way, one squillion, competitors in the training business. It's unbelievable. And the fees range from incredibly low to very, very high. We're in the very high part, by the way. We're, in a, we're a premium brand. We're a brand with high quality. It takes 250 hours of training to be certified as a Dale Carnegie trainer. You have to recertify every year. It's an incredibly high, it's the elite of the elite trainer level. So it has a brand and a premium attachment to it. But, you know, what would your clients pay for that? So these things you need to ask. And what's the model? How would you get revenue? How would you get the money in? Is it going to be by time? Is it going to be, as I said before, subscription? Is it a one-off? How will that work in the pricing? Again, this is, this is tricky. How do you attach the pricing? Do you have multiple products for the one price? Do you have a range of services which have pricing attached to them? What would you do there? And in terms of payment, the rule of thumb for payment is this. The bigger, richer, and more powerful the company, the longer the time it will before they'll pay you. Okay? It shouldn't be like that, should it? Logically, they've got lots of dough and they should be able to pay you in 30 days. They don't. They tell you, oh, you're a small company? <laughs> 60 days or 90 days for you, sunshine. And you've got a choice. You say, well, I'm not going to take that and not have the business or you wear it. What do you think we do? We wear it, right? Are we happy about it? No. But everyone else who you're getting supplies from, they want 30 days. So these are the things you don't think about. Oh, I'm going to get paid, but you're not going to get paid immediately. And if it's not, this is a tricky thing too. It's not even, you know, not even fair. They say, oh yeah, we pay on the, um, we, we, we'll pay you in that next month. And then you don't get your invoice in before the 12th or the 13th of the month. And the accounting department says, oh, Look at that, you missed the deadline, you'll get paid at the end of the following month. Right? So then it extends even further. Right? So you might think I'll get paid this month, but actually it's going to be 45 days. You know, these are the things that can really make cash flow a nightmare. And then do you have a profit diagnostic tool? Can you actually calibrate 
all the costs against the profit. In our case, we can tell you down to the paper clip what running a course will cost. Down to the paper clip. It's calculated to that level. It's all spreadsheet, punching the numbers. That class of that size is going to bring this much profit. You need to have something like that too. You need to build that early because this will help you trying to work out your revenue status. And costs. So, uh, what are the key costs you're going to find? And, you know, you'll find probably um, your most expensive resources will usually be people. Usually be people. Might be some technology involved, but they normally, you know, if I look at my uh, P&L every month, where's all the dough go? People. A big chunk of it goes in royalty to Dale Carnegie. A big chunk of it goes to Mori, Moribiru, because <laughs> we're in Moribiru. And a big chunk of it goes to my trainers. And a big chunk of it goes to my staff. Right? So that's, that's my key cost to tie it up right there. It's not computers. It's, it's not uh, projectors. It's not uh, you know, that type of thing. It tends to be more in the people component. Although in your business, it may be technology. It may be a machine. It may be uh, programmers working to create software or apps or whatever it might be. But that's sort of a people cost anyway, isn't it? And this is the real critical one on cash flow control. After this class, all go out and get the tattoo. Cash flow is everything. All right? Get that tattooed on your body because when you get that wrong, you are finished. And it doesn't take much to get it wrong. We had, after the uh, 2011 earthquake, I don't know how many people were here during the earthquake. Quite a few of you, right? You remember after the earthquake, right? Earthquake, tsunami, nuclear meltdown, right? For months, we had tremors, massive, big tremors every day, five, six, seven, for week after week after week. Does anybody want to do any training in that environment? Nobody. So for four months, we had no business. Four months, no cash flow. I tell you what, I really learned about cash flow during that period. And this is the problem. You can have a downturn or a delayed payment or people return the goods and won't pay it or they want to dispute with you in court. Any number of things can happen. The money you expected to come in doesn't come in. You don't have enough reserves and then suddenly you're out of business. It can happen very, 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 very easily and quickly. So please pay very close attention to having good buffer of cash because you are definitely going to need it at some point. Which begs the problem of, well, how do I invest to grow my business? This is the, this is the lever dilemma. You know, if I push one lever, it affects the cash flow. If I preserve the cash flow, but now I can't grow my business because I can't get the people into invest or the equipment in to invest. So that, that balancing act between investment and cash is a dilemma. I would love to grow my business much faster. But if I do, I have the potential in a very short order of blowing it up. I go out and hire five new salespeople. Oh, great. I've got five more salespeople. That's fantastic. It takes about a year for salespeople in my business to become functional. A year. So the money's going out like a flood and it's coming in like a trickle. And then I have a problem in the economy. We're finished. It's that quick. It's that easy. So this is something you really get the tattoo. Trust me. If you want to ref remember one thing, it's that. So you've got your fixed and variable costs. So, you know, whether you're um, running classes or not running classes after the earthquake, you're still paying more bitter their rent. You know? You're still paying for the electricity. Whatever it is that's going, your staff costs. Staff still want to get paid. Funnily enough, they like you probably want to get paid too, right? So that fixed and variable cost, get that balance right. Try and have your fixed cost as low as possible, somewhere around about 30, if you get down to 30%, 35%, that's pretty good for most businesses, 30, 35% is pretty good. You start getting it, you might start up, it might be 60%. You start working it down, as you grow the revenues, the balance switches and then those fixed costs become a small proportion of the overall revenue. That will work, but you may find it's very high at the beginning and try and get that down, drive it down. Then the cost of funding. Well, fortunately, we've now gone to negative interest rates in Japan. So theoretically, our cost of funding, if we're borrowing from banks, if we're able to borrow from banks, should come down. Now, I've got banks 
contacted me all the time, begging me to take money. Please, please take a loan. Please take a loan. And I'm trying to say, uh, nope, you don't want to do that if I can avoid it. But sometimes you've got no choice. If you get into a cash flow area and there's been a downturn in the economy, you may need to bridge finance for a certain period of time before you can pay it off. Now, the interest rates are extremely low. So your actual cost of money is extremely cheap in Japan. That's one of the benefits of being here. I said, for an Australian, the cost of doing business there from terms of cost of funding is much higher, much, much higher. So we're, in one way, in an uh, advantageous position in Japan regarding the cost of funding. And the resources, so, you know, the, uh, what's the value proposition on the curio? It's your people. It could be your distribution channels. You've got a relationship with someone who's uh, on selling your product for you. They're getting your product into their stores, into their outlets, or you might be an affiliate on an online situation. Someone might have produced something, and you're an affiliate. You sell their product on behalf of them and get a royalty, get a, a fee for that. What's the... Uh, What's the customer relationship you're going to have? Is it going to be direct? Is it going to be indirect? Through wholesalers. Uh, if you've ever gone to one of those little bars and you see them under railway lines, they're like a little hole in the wall, and you're having, you know, yakitori and beers and this type of thing, and you wonder, geez, where do they keep all the beer? And, you know, every couple of hours, a little old guy on a little motorbike, a little 50cc motorbike turns up with a crate of beer strapped to the back, and he unloads one crate, and then he goes away. That's a distribution model for that business, you know, because they've got no space to store it. So you've got to think about your distribution channel and how you're going to get to people. And also, uh, what's the revenue stream in terms of the your resource, your time, okay, your time. This is, uh, uh, as a resource, incredibly important. You, know, you see that joke about uh, now working as a self-employed person 100 hours a week to get away from that 40 hour a week job, you hate it, right? That's one of the ironies. You go into your own business, you wind up working extraordinary hours. So if you calculate the hours you work for the money you make, you're working for peanuts in a lot of cases. But at least you have other benefits to it, right? But you need to think about those things. Is what I'm going to do going to be actually worth it in terms of overall revenue return against the hours that I'm going to have to work? And for a lot of uh, self-employed people, they can't take holidays. They cannot go because they don't have the staff who can step up or they worry about the business, or they, they can't relax, so they're, they're trapped by their job, or you buy a job. Uh, often people buy franchises, it's a way of buying a job. They can't get a job, so they buy a job. You know? There's a different driver there for being in business. And so credit, access to credit, I don't know what your credit rating is, but it'd be good to have a very strong one, because you want to get money out of banks. They're, in Japan, they want person guarantees. Right? They want the works, they want to have everything you've got. You go down, they want to take the lot. And they'll take it. They'll take everything. So Japan, in that sense, doesn't have the sort of liability limitations we have in other countries. Here, they get the work. So you'll hear about that, I'm sure, in more detail from the uh, specialists who talked to you about that. And also the brand. Our brand, Dale Carnegie, it's a, it's a well-known brand name around the world, 104-year-old company. I paid a lot of money to buy this franchise for that brand. That's what I was buying. But that helps me. When I turn up and I give my card, it's got credibility. People recognize it for the most part. So there's a, a resource there that's very valuable for me in business. What's the resource going to be? You won't, may not have a brand. You may have to establish the brand. Well, what's the brand going to represent? You know, how, will you, how will you strengthen that brand? How will you uh, promulgate that brand? What will you do about that? And then uh, we've got sort of key activities. Now, uh, time is all we've got. How we use our time determines everything. And I do a lot of training in companies, and I do a lot of executives uh, coaching and teaching, and I ask them, you know, uh, who plans their day with a to-do list and works off things in order of priority? How their hand goes up. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I don't know how they survive. But you're going to have to be extremely time efficient. You're going to have to have things have got to be done in a certain prioritised order, and you've got to be disciplined and religious about hitting them in that order to get everything done, because the things you have to do are so immense, the time consumed is so great, that you've got to get as much efficiency out of that, or you'll blow yourself up. You're making decisions when you're tired, um, you're not really sharp about doing brainstorming, because you're just worn out all the time. It's not a good way to run your business, you know. We say, you've got to work harder on your business, you know, than just uh, 
or sorry, I should say work harder on yourself than on your business. So that is really a time allocation. Work harder on yourself, improving yourself than on your business. Because the business will just suck the time up. So what about the sales activity? Are you a salesperson? Do you have sales training? Uh, will you have people who are salespeople? Will you hire them? How will you know if they're any good? How will you test them when you're hiring them? What can you look at to ascertain if they're going to be any good to you or not? What is your marketing capability? What do you know about marketing? Will you be able to hire people who know about marketing? Delivery. What's the delivery component? As I said before, for our trainers to be able to deliver, they have to do a minimum 250 hours just to certify. So the delivery component for us is incredibly important because the content can become a commodity. But the delivery is not a commodity. It's a very powerful element in our brand. So as an activity, that's extremely important what we do there. And leadership, what's your leadership capacity? Now, uh, Dale Carnegie should be like a, you know, a thousand person company in Japan. We've been here 53 years. But interesting enough, Mr. Mochizuki, who started the business here in Japan in 1963, he didn't want to have a big organization. You know, he and Fumi, the wife, started the company together and they grew it to a certain size and they were very successful. And he was happy with that. He didn't want to have leadership aspirations to run a big organization. You know, so how big do you want it to be and then what are your leadership capability? Can you take it to a big scale if it's successful? Now, one of the reasons Steve Jobs lost his job with Apple was because he was okay at a certain size of the business. When it got to a certain scale, the board members and stakeholders said, you know what, this guy's not up to running an organization of this scale. So they got rid of him. Then he went away and he did other things. He grew up a bit in business and came back and was more successful. But at that time, he couldn't be successful because his limitations of leadership were holding him down. We're all like that. You know, there's a thing called the Peter Principle. You might remember the Peter Principle from the 60s where you've got, uh, you get to the, uh, you rise to the height of your incompetence. Right? We rise to the height of our incompetence. We get to a certain point, we run out of competence. That's where we stop. Or we get more confidence and confidence to go higher. So, strategy two. How well have you strategized what you're doing? How good are you in strategy? How thorough? What do you know about strategy? What is your strategy? Is it written down? Can you show us your business plan? Does it have a long-term aspiration there about where you're going to take the business? And then partners. Who are those key partners? Who are, are people supplying you with services or goods? You know, who are they? What's the leverage? You know, if people can do things for you more efficiently, you should let them do it. You may have to pay them a fee, but it's probably more efficient time-wise for them to do it. We've got to look for leverage. If you're a small company, maybe you can't do everything, then you have to outsource. Lots and lots of things. We don't have an accountant in our company. We outsource that to the accountant because we can't afford it, our size to have a full-time person doing the accounts. We have bookkeeping, but we don't have the full you know, tax requirement accounting skills. It's too expensive for us. We don't need that much. We don't, you know, it's not that complicated. Outsource it. So there'll be lots of things like that. So what are the sort of main activities those partners will be doing? Do you need partners? Who will they be? What do you want them to do? How will you pay them? Now, I'm not going to go through these in detail. These are in your pack. But these are just examples. This is Facebook. If we took this business canvas model and we applied it to Facebook, this is what Facebook would look like as a business, to give you an idea in your own business how your business could look. And it's in your pack. Don't try and read off the screen. Read off the sheets. This is Kelly's lemonade stand, a very simple example, right? Kelly's got her own lemonade stand. Just, again, a very simple example of all the things that if you're going to do that, What's required to give you an idea for your business, which is probably going to be a bit more complicated than the lemonade stand, but this is the minimum that you've got to have, right? And this is Gillette razors and blades. So this is Gillette's model as another example for you on things you've got to do. And then finally, we've got uh, Amazon.com here uh, as another example. And that's in the hard copy, so please have a look at those. And go and look at that business canvas model because uh, it's quite a useful paradigm to look at all aspects of your business. So, I've gone through the whole business canvas model in some degree of depth for the time we have today. I'm going to open it up for questions. We're going to have about 15 minutes for questions. So who would like to ask the first question? Yes, please. And can you give us a loud voice there, Pascal, so sure. people can hear you. What's one of the most challenging aspects of running a business here? Language, I would say, is number one. Now, I've lived here for 
30 years. I came here to study Japanese in 1979 at uh, Georgia University, so I speak fairly uh, competently, I think, in business level Japanese. But there's always that, that degree of, I'm not a native speaker. I'm a native speaker of English, so my fluency level of my ability to persuade and describe uh, is much higher in my native language. So you're always operating at a bit of a disadvantage if you're operating in Japanese with native speakers of Japanese. That's one part. The other part, I guess, is also trust. How long are you going to be here? You know, you foreigners, you come, you go. Uh, I think you remember a word called flygin. Yeah. The uh, French embassy, the German embassy, and I uh, sadly have to say the Australian embassy gave out official advice that people should evacuate Tokyo after the uh, uh, nuclear power plants uh, you know, had a meltdown. So a lot of foreigners suddenly just left. And so, you know, for their clients, uh, for their staff, that was a big shock. You are not committed to this country. We're not going anywhere. We live here, but you're, all, you're leaving us. Right? So this is, I didn't move. I stayed. I, I said, no, I'm not going anywhere. I calculated what the risk was. I decided the risk wasn't high. I'm not going anywhere. And I tell Japanese that. You know, if you get in those guys, say, no, I didn't do that. I stayed. Because I'm trying to show them I'm committed, like you are, to this business. I'm not going to be here today, gone tomorrow. But what about you? you know, are you going to be around? If you start this business, you've got to be here for the long haul. You can't do it for you know, a couple of years and then drop out. People want to know uh, they can rely on you. And I think for Japanese particularly, being so risk averse, they like to do business with people they trust. And once they start business with you, the trust is established. They'd rather go for the devil they, they know than the devil they don't know, as that old English expression goes. So they'd rather go with the somebody they've been dealing with they know in a known quantity, then take a risk on the new. Now, often we're the new. And we're the new competing with the Japanese supplier. And the Japanese supplier's great-grandfather took the buyer's great-grandfather out to, you know, hostess bars and golf days, you know? So it's a very long-established relationship, and you're trying to get in there with your price point. You're fighting against trust there. They're looking at your price point and saying, well, that's a better price point, but you might be out of business. And I've had this happen that uh, the previous business I've been in, uh, the competitors will spread a rumour in the market that your business is financially unstable and about to go down. It's not true, but they tell all your, all your buyers that. And so your buyers get very, very paranoid and nervous. So, you know, there are no rules. It's, all, it's a street fight here. I mean, Japan's very decorous, and Japanese people are tremendously polite, and everything functions and it works, and there's a lot of trust here. But in, in you know, get the elbows out in business, a lot of uh, Japanese competitors will play by very tough, very tough rules, you know, and they will say things about your company which aren't true to take you out. Or they'll get a cartel. You're constantly reading about Japanese businesses being fined all around the world for creating cartels to control price. And I've had this happen. They will control the price by deciding in the cartel which one's going to take the hit. And so they'll drop their price way below your price, take a loss, kill you, and then the others agree that when the contracts come back, that company will get the contract to recompense them for the loss they took. This is the reality, right? So being under the radar is not a bad thing. Stay under the radar, because if you pop up, you might get whacked. You know, that's also possible. So these are things to consider. Where's the next question? Yeah, please. I'm not quite sure if this is actually a question that can be answered, but sort of going from sort of the nine to five type of job to start your own company, you know, it's what kind of size or scale you need to be to make it viable that you can actually live to the, the level that you become a customer to. Very hard to, uh, the, the question is, when you move from a, a guaranteed salaried position to a position where you're running your own business where there's no guarantee of your remuneration on a regular basis, how long does it take or how large do you have to become to get to a point where you're going to have some comfort of income? It'll vary so much. It's, I can't answer that specifically because it depends on the business. But uh, one of the possibilities is to uh, either, in your planning, do very, very clear calculation and take a conservative position on where you see the revenues coming in against the costs, etc. To give yourself an idea of how long that will take. Another might be that in your current job, you might have some capacity, particularly if it's an online business, to start the business while you're still working and run the two in tandem until some point where it crosses over. 
Uh, it depends on you know what you're doing, but that might be an ideal thing. Or it might be someone who you can partner with, who can actually you know goes into the business while you're still working. In our case, one of our partners came into the business to run it, and I stayed working for my company. I was, I was running a very large bank here at the time, and I you know I was getting very well paid, and so that had a guarantee of income. And then he was in the company, so you know we sometimes you're able to do it that way, and then it, at the right point, I was able to move into the company and, uh, and work in the business. So there are perhaps some uh, timings that you can use of when you get into it or running things in parallel. Or you buy an existing business, so you actually can look at the numbers. You can see what the numbers are. You see, okay, here's the cost, here's the expenditure, here's the marketing. You know, And you won't know everything. I mean, you won't know everything. There's always a sting in the tail. You know, There's always a sting in the tail. You get that little blue... Tiffany box, you know, with the ribbon, and this is your new business you just bought, and you take the ribbon off, and you open up the box, and you discover, oh, some things missing in this box that I thought I'd bought. Uh, trust me, that's a very common experience, right? When you actually buy it, you suddenly discover, oh, this isn't quite what I thought it would be. You won't know. But you've got to try and allow for that as much as you can. Here's the next question. Yes, please. <clears throat> okay, I want to take this as legal advice or anything. I'm, I, so I'm a permanent resident in Japan. I'm going to open up my own business on time. I have a, a friend who doesn't have a visa back in Japan, so I'm just curious if we open like a JK, I just pay test with you know, one yen or something like that, so he can open up his business. I don't think he's a great business person. I don't know how he's going to do, but um, for this individual, you know, he's kind of a good enough guy that I'd like to see him have that opportunity. The question is, uh, and I guess your question is around about permanent residency and non-permanent residency and the ability to run a company in Japan, and should you help your friend because you've got permanent residency and therefore some great security of being able to stay in this country to assist him in his business. And you can start the business from one yen these days, which is great. I'm not a permanent resident of Japan. I have actually, I, my, my visa is under... Uh, judgment at the moment over in Shinagara with some mighty bureaucrat uh, going through the documents deciding whether I can stay here for another you know, three to four years or whatever it's going to be under an investor manager visa status that I have. And yet I'm running the company. You know, so I think uh, it's going to vary from person to person. But helping your friend to start a business because he doesn't have permanent residency is not a prerequisite for your friend to start a business. There's no legal requirement that he have permanent residency. As long as, it depends on the visa, uh, if it goes to an investor manager visa, then that's probably not going to be an issue. If it's something else that is uh, contradicting the activities he may undertake in Japan, that's a different issue. But presuming he doesn't have that problem, you do not need to do that. And that's not probably the, uh, I would say, uh, given what I've gone through, that would not be the, the, the turning point of my decision to join that company, because you will have liabilities once you join that company for the outcome, depending on your relationship within that business. So I think, uh, don't worry about the visa, that's his problem. I think we've come to time. There's a hint that we've come to time. Let me thank you very much for your attention today. I hope that was helpful. I'll be here for a little while. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan series. I hope you found that program useful. It's uh, probably a broad range of ideas that will suit a business in any particular country or culture, but gave a little bit of a Japan feel to that, and I hope that was interesting for everyone. So, if you enjoy the series, you think it's useful, um, maybe you can share it with other people and let them know that we have every week something about leadership we can share with everyone. And as I mentioned, if you have a performance or people problem in Japan, then here we are to help you. So please let me know. I'm contactable at greg.story, that's G-R-E-G -E dot story, S-T-O-R-Y, at dalecarnegie.com now as i mentioned we've got dale carnegie training free reports white papers guidebooks training videos blogs newsletters 
course information plus truckloads of other stuff. So if you'd like to access any of these free materials and go to japan.dalecarnegie.com.